Um, Mostly, I thought one of the really exciting things about this was how it's a free, on this website, that's a free resource, so domatox.org. Mm -hmm. So it has a bunch of good stuff on it, and nobody has to buy a book to participate in this, so that was a big draw for me. Especially because I have a limited budget. <laughs> that's fair, yeah. Um, so one of the things that it starts talking about is the breathing practice and that it had and it's different instructions on the breathing practice i will say and i'm sure you did this as well if you read this but like as i was reading i found myself paying attention to my breath <laughs> like because yeah, i was obviously. talking about it yeah yeah sure um and that I like that it's explaining what the tetrads are. It breaks it down for you into these different pieces and helps um, really walk you through it. And then I thought it was interesting the decision to differentiate between fabrication and attention. I thought that was okay. kind of interesting. I, I, it sounds familiar as a concept, but this feels like the first time I've seen that. Hello, Lee. Hi, Lee. Long time no, no see. Yes, hello. I'm also currently at in-law's house, but everybody's out doing other stuff at the moment, so I'm going to try to right. pop in for a little bit. But I got interrupted a lot while trying to read, too, so I didn't get there very far. That's okay. Um, I, was... I cannot contribute much, maybe. That's okay. I was just telling Ben I chose it because, one, it's free, and I hadn't read actual Dhamma Talks in a long time, so this was very alluring to me as a choice for some discussion. Mm -hmm. And it was the topic that you had said you were hoping yeah, to read so about, too. At, so. On a personal note, um, since becoming a parent, I have been struggling a lot with my... Um, intrusive thoughts around death and around illness and so this anxiety that creeps around not just like of my son getting sick but like literal intrusive visions in my mind of like what if he found my dead body <laughs> wow. like what if I was home alone with him and I died and then he's just there with my dead body and then I envision all this trauma and suffering it would bring to him and these, it's just very intrusive, you know what I mean? And sometimes I can stop it when I'm really mindful and, uh, or I use an old coping mechanism of mine where I sing at my thoughts. If I just start singing a song, um, I can frequently stop an intrusive thought process from happening. Um, hmm. This looks crazy to the outward for a person because I'll just be sitting there and suddenly go, don't stop believing. <laughs> Hold on to that feeling. But if I do that, if I if I play, if I sing an earworm, I can frequently halt an intrusive thought process. So um, that's become harder with these types of intrusive thoughts. And so this particular topic has a lot of weight for me as something I really need to stop grasping at and holding on to so tightly. Um. And I don't know what mechanism's going on in my brain that's making it come back and back and back. Um, it might be hormone related because I hear that's a problem for a while after mm -hmm. after Babu come out of body. Um, you know, and just these processes and thoughts that I'm having. So for me, this was a very personal choice for reading. Yes. Facing aging, illness, and death. Um, I don't know how far you got to read, Lee, but what I was saying is I like how the speaker is breaking apart Tetrid for us and helping me understand the little ins and outs of it. Yeah, I didn't get through any of this. I read, like, very little. Probably, mm -hmm. what, like, two pages of and I also read the preface and intro and like, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't, I don't even think I got to here. So wherever is right before that, most likely. <laughs> uh, That's fine. But, yeah, there's a lot of people here and things going on and stuff. 
Um, anyway, you can mm-hmm. continue what you were saying before I arrived. I appreciated it as a really foundational thing to come back to as far as come back to the breath and the different things he goes through um, in his talks. I think that the other talks also do a really good job of helping you realize that having a strict idea of what meditation breathing looks like is ridiculous where he discusses the flowing of the in to the out instead of thinking about it as a hard in and a hard out like (gasps) (sighs) yeah yeah and so that discussion was really good for me personally and because i have to i have to come back to my breathing a lot um and i talk about this with you guys constantly and i'm sorry but i'm a teacher and so (laughs) frequently i i am forced to practice my practice many times of day um as the students some sometimes their behavior makes feelings arise in me that i must not cling to and i must as the responsible adult let them flow off me so that I can respond to them as they are, not as they're making me feel. Um, and so I will say also that in reading these passages, I have also found worth in those areas as well. Um, I, although this talk, personally, kind of weird to talk about specifically on its own. And as far as um and then here he says this thing because <laughs> it's not holy in that any one sentence jumps out to me as like oh look at that phrase or look at that but that in reading it i found myself slowing down quite a bit to really feel my practice and so it felt like a nice little guide in that way for me personally you right back <laughs> ben left rude bin um i thought it was interesting here though in this part where he's like talking about if you're not careful about your breathing it you start to connect too much with your blood flow and feeling restrained in your body because of the way the blood flows in the body and i was like interesting (laughs) the question sometimes is asked why does the buddha use a technical term bodily fabrication when he's simply talking about the in and out breath the answer as i've already indicated is that he's pointing to the role that your intentions play in shaping the way you breathe there you go lee respond (laughs) i mean by the by itself I, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't even know if that's really correct. Like, I don't either. Why somebody chose to name something a certain way. Like, yes, okay, the Buddha does talk about intention. Like, the thing is, it's vol- both voluntary and involuntary breathing is, right? Yeah. So, yes, you're supposed to be aware of what you're doing and then kind of, like, guiding this involuntary process and shaping it to serve you better uh but i don't know <laughs> the way that that's worded here uh, i'm not sure i guess is that the answer maybe i don't know i suppose it doesn't seem incorrect <laughs> i don't know the answer <laughs> um I think one of the things that you would probably find interesting later in the readings that I chose for today is that uh, he refers to the contradiction of the fact that when you're doing these practices and really going through this path that your mind is playing both the role of teacher and student a lot of the time. And I thought that was kind of an interesting reflection that it can add an extra level of difficulty because it's doing, you know, double time on the word. Hmm. So there you go. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of interesting, like as basic as everything is, right? Mm -hmm. That's, That's always something that gets me is, 
it's all so simple. And yes. yet, there are so many, uh, like, so many angles you can come at it from that have just, mm-hmm. like, there's a nuance to it. There's, like, the slight difference that we can continue to talk about it anyway. Mm-hmm. I know. It's, like, it's all, it's all really interesting to me. Let's pop ahead a little. Um, he does a and a in between, they put in a and a in between the talks where presumably a student in the room has asked this question and he's res- their respond I say he I don't actually remember who's talking the speaker is speaking here um and so some of this is interesting in that he'll elaborate they'll re- elaborate on their idea um I won't lie to you I did not thoroughly read the Q&As in between the the talks I browsed them briefly um, Don't think you missed a whole lot. Of... <clears throat> hmm? I don't think you missed a whole lot. Um, I, I mean, I, I read them, but um, yeah, I don't. I, I, at least I didn't take any note of anything that was in there. So yeah, yeah nothing was like ah. So. Everyone is definitely welcome to read those if they want. All right. The process of rebirth. My brain has to catch up. What did, what did this one? Oh, yeah. This talks about rebirth. And I think it was a better hint at, like, karma and what it actually means for a person versus, like, the more colloquial use of the word um, in modern culture, right? Of, like... Oh, I, yeah. I found that very fascinating um that he that he says basically uh, depending on your state of mind you may get different options on where to go next yeah and um that's that's uh, reminded me uh i mean there was a while ago i i, I dove into that rabbit hole of uh, of like near death ex- death experience and how people were experiencing different dimensions, different worlds, and such. Mm-hmm. And so the although there was often a lot of similarities, but uh, at the same time there were also a lot of differences. And so that seems to point uh, in a similar direction in that. Yeah, depending on your state of mind, like if you think you're you're totally guilty or you need to suffer, you might actually uh, yeah, go, go to hell. Yeah, send so... yourself to the place where, yeah, in, into the circumstance where you can be punished or suffer. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, I found that a very uh, interesting, um, you know, what's the word, um, similarity there or something that, that meshes very nicely together. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Yeah. That was a great summary of this section, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> I have nothing really to add. Um, other than you just... You, I, I think it just really emphasizes how you can't cling to even this idea of guilt. If you're like, why am I not doing the good thing? can't cling to that you just gotta keep doing the good thing and being okay with that I don't know um he does let you know that you don't have to follow all these steps in order there there's more fluidity to it all than that which I appreciate somebody pointing out I think it's something I feel intuitively about a lot of stuff, but some people do need that pointed out to them. I think about this a lot with my students, right? Like sometimes I show them how to do something and they think that it has to be in the exact order. And I'm like, well, no, you can do it in any order. (laughs) I just got to do them all at some point. Um, I also appreciated the reminder to let my body breathe out on its own because I do realize that I try to squeeze out that breath. And so the fact that I need to kind of let the body breathe out on its own is good. It was a good little reminder for me personally. 
appreciated it. This one, this is interesting for me because I, well, I guess it's, maybe it's a little different for me too because I know, like, my first exposure to breathing meditation was very, very young. And also just, like, having attention on breath not even in a meditative sense, but just in general, like being aware of your body and how much sound you're making and how like aggressively or calmly you're doing things and Mm -hmm. all of that. I think like culturally that that was important thing. Like I learned as a child to be very aware of my body and my presence in a space. And like now I think I, normally just kind of let the breath go but then when I'm talking to other people or I hear other people like my husband has a difficulty in controlling his breathing because he is I guess because he's not practiced in it but he's like I don't know how to do that I say oh you're like breathing out literally one second out breath or one to two second out breath where you're just like and blow it all out <laughs> that's gonna give you anxiety like it yeah. will cause you to have worse anxiety if you especially like I think Max was talking about this one day a while ago but if you're breathing in if your inhale is uh, shorter than your exhale that's uh, something in the limbic system gets activated when your exhales are longer and then you do this and this to help control the body's response and like yeah, well you... that definitely is going to make it worse if you can't you know yeah if you if you mm-hmm. exhale longer then the parasympathicus is activated whereas when you inhale longer you are basically putting yourself in a more activated state and you are Particles gets activated. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really important thing to know how to do. But then I notice those things and say, oh, you should try to, you know, moderate that and let it go slower. You don't need to force the air out. It's like, I don't know how to do that. And I go, I don't know how to tell you how to do that. Yeah. I can describe, oh, yeah, do this. But how do you do that? I don't know. Is that a thing that they, has anybody heard how do you do that? I don't know how to tell somebody how to do that. Just stop mm-hmm. pushing it, I guess. But I mostly think about it like I'm clenching your muscles. Like when you relax any other muscle, just relax your diaphragm. Yeah. Hmm. Um, most, but I'm also really aware of that because I'm a very high tense person and I clench all sorts of muscles, like my jaw, my, I mean, I'm known for like mm-hmm. clenching my jaw so hard. It gives me a migraine, <laughs> you know, like, and so for years and years, I've, I've just, I try so hard. I try really hard to be aware so that I can like, oh, let go of the tension there. And that's a very difficult skill to learn. I think if you're somebody who's used to holding a lot of that together. Um, like even now I can feel myself holding tension in my upper shoulders, like just the way I'm holding my body. Um, and it, yeah, that's, I I can definitely relate to that. And, um, yeah, if you, if you have really this pattern of being, um, benching, for example, um, yeah, that can forever to unknown. <clears throat> so when I was reading this section about like letting the body release the breath, I kind of thought of it the same way. And I tried it out and I do feel like the way the breath leaves is different when I do it that way. But then I also liked where he was discussing, like, you don't need a hard stop between the in and out. It can be a flowing from one to the other. And I think that also helped with my sensation of what it felt like to just let the breath leave. Because I wasn't looking to breathe out so much as just kind of slow transition from one to the other. Anyway. 
Um, his discussion of Rapture was interesting, and, like, I didn't 100% follow it, whether that was because my brain wasn't clicking or because my toddler was yelling at me, I can't say, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he uses the word rapture um, similar to one would use ecstasy. So, um, mm -hmm. so basically, you can, yeah, bring yourself through meditation and breathing to these ecstatic states and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have another Q and A that I also skimmed. I, I skimmed all the Q and As. I didn't spend a lot of time on them. Um, cause it felt like people just looking for clarity of information and unless I also had the same question, I didn't stop and really absorb what I was reading, which is a terrible way to read it, but here we are. Um, <laughs> uh, yep. Although, for anyone interested. I, did, I found it very it. interesting in... And there is one passage here where it says, um, I think it's a little bit above, where one person asks, um, isn't it more compassionate to uh, become a bodhisattva and then return until everyone else is enlightened? And he basically says, no, <laughs> if everyone becomes a bodhisattva, they, he, uh, he does. Um, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the, the second cue there. Um, and he says, basically, uh, if all people become bodhisattvas, then it's basically like a burning, uh, burning cinema, and people are getting stuck in the door because they are saying, you go first. And oh. <laughs> kind of hilarious, because, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's too many people trying to get through the burning door now that are too polite. I found yeah. that really funny. Yeah. I think that the way this guy speaks is really relatable, and I do enjoy his uh, metaphors quite a bit. That's an interesting um, perspective to, do, to see the differences between the, the schools of Buddhism, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Is this... Wait, no. Have I gone too far? I don't know. I don't remember. This is... Where are we? Lessons for aging. And we're right here. Alright, we got this section and one more section. That's where we are. This is the table of contents. It's really useful for... Hyperlinking to everything. In case you guys are wondering, which is how... nice because not all the books have that. No, not all books have that. So this is very nice and easy to jump to where exactly where you need to be, which is why I didn't. And this book doesn't because it's a selection of talks, right, based on dates that they happen. It doesn't have them all named like chapter one, chapter two. So I had to go through and find the names of everything and write that out. <laughs> anyway. All right, lessons for aging. Is this the one where he uses the fire jumping to a house metaphor? Or was that the next one? No, I think it might be the next one. Mental. The canon's discussion of mental beauty is fairly brief. It focuses on two main qualities. The first type of mental beauty is virtue. This means restraining yourself from causing harm. Let's see. And then... Emphasis on the state of mind with which you observe these precepts. Very exciting. The second quality that the Buddha describes is a form of mental beauty is called a cluster of three things. So, <laughs> you know, Buddhism's favorite thing, a list within a list, right? <laughs> Two mental qualities, but then, but to live one of those mental qualities is three things. Composure, forbearance, and equanimity. Um, so, this is a good teaching as far as really starting to dive deeper into the qualities that you're seeking, I guess, or at least trying to be more open to. I'm going to say open to them, because you're not seeking them so much as trying to find them where they already are. But that's a whole other way of talking. 
Speaking of which, tangent in my brain as I'm connecting the readings that I've I did. Um, I thought it was interesting where he was talking about something, and my brain has farted out as I'm talking. Dang it! <laughs> he was talking about something mental. Nope, it'll come back to me. Never mind. Nothing's interesting. I don't remember anything. Because, <laughs> oh gosh, what was it that I was just thinking? This is what I get for using wood stain before a book club. <laughs> I should have worn three masks or something. Maybe you need some uh, better ventilation. I was outside! <laughs> I didn't do it in my house. I was outside. <laughs> you were outside, Des. I was outside staining Des is some huffing, wood. Uh, paint fumes. I was not intending to. I was varnish. just trying to stain the ladder. <laughs> Make it look better. Sh sure. <laughs> A likely story. Um, if if uh. The partaking in intoxicants makes you productive. Is it okay? <laughs> it does not make me productive, though. <laughs> it's making me forget what I was about to well, say. I mean, you're staining the ladder, so it's productive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that a metaphor? Is the ladder a metaphor for something? No, I found this cool wooden ladder on the side of the road while I was driving, and I picked it up, and so I sanded it, and I just stained it <laughs> so it will preserve it better. Cause okay, but Tess, is the latter a metaphor? I don't know, but I was in the middle of reading something from this passage, actually, about the fear of death, right? Oh, um, okay. In one of these passages, and I was in my son's room while he was playing on his own, and suddenly he throws a book at me, <laughs> and the book lands <laughs> open on this, well, like, I grab it in such a way that I open it to the page of this little dog character being afraid to go down the slide and I was like, you're right, Cypress. This is like the fear of death. <laughs> <laughs> and I made this weird connection suddenly to a child's fear of going down a ladder to the fear of death during re during our own deaths. There we our, go. In our ends. I knew there was a hidden meaning somewhere. <laughs> I was just like, wow, brain. Thanks, I guess. <laughs> wow, universe, thanks. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I guess I learned something. Go me. Um, Max, I'm sure you did not read anything, but these. Absolutely re not. These Dhamma talks are a nice little <laughs> um, piece of education about different parts of Buddhism. Um, it talks about the Tetras, it talks about the different. Um, states of mind and a lot of other little things so it's good little reading i think for anyone who just wanting to beef up their understanding around certain um, perspectives of meditation because and the how the breathing works and that i thought it had a lot of good reminders in it for someone i'm down to read it i frankly didn't even realize this was happening today i made a post I tagged everyone <laughs> in it two weeks ago. Right. Awesome. Two weeks is plenty of time for me to forget everything true. that's ever happened. <laughs> Look. Because you're living in the moment. Exactly. Two weeks ago doesn't oh. exist anymore. I do tell my <laughs> students that a lot while we're on a tangent. Like my, <laughs> They'll be like, Miss West, when do I have your class? Because they'll catch me in the hallway. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't even know who I'm teaching today. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't looked at my, my clipboard yet. <laughs> my other brain is taking care of that right now. My other brain being the clipboard where I make my notes. Um, good, good clarification. <laughs> That's what I call my, my binder where I keep all these notes and like rosters and my calendar is like, this is my other brain. <laughs> um... I just thought of calling someone named Ross, Roster, and how annoying that would be. This is entirely unrelated. Mm-hmm. Yup. <laughs> My coffee hasn't kicked in yet. It's just ADHD up here. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I 
accidentally fumed myself with some wood stain. So we're dealing with the ramifications of that choice that I made today. We so, out here being problems. <laughs> whoop, whoop. So the basic lesson is, as you get older, don't focus on what you can't do. Focus on what you can still do. That's good. Thank you. Good, uh, good sentence. Um, because apparently this teacher is quoted as saying, see how much goodness you can squeeze out of your body before you have to throw it away. Wow. <laughs> um, I get it, but that sure is a vibe. Yeah, it is a vibe. As a Dalma practitioner, your bucket list should be focused on the good things you want to accomplish before you die. This attitude is based on the conviction that the good that you do never goes to waste. These are all good things, I think, to keep in mind. This is nice. I don't know. I was enjoying... So, for something that's titled something I think we would automatically call dark or down, as far as aging, sickness, and death, I found that the... Um, Writing has been very uplifting for me to read in that the way that it's written is very encouraging. It encourages you to make good of the time you have. It make, encourages you to meditate. You know what I mean? So it feels, I don't know, it feels good to read, I guess. This is how my brain <laughs> I feel refreshed having gone through these teachings this this these last few days as I was entering a weird state <laughs> where I had been neglecting my practice and my reading. And the reading is very important part of my practice because it helps realign my brain. Um, because otherwise it's really easy for me to consume all kinds of media that is not like nourish, nourishing me, I guess. <laughs> to get floofy about it. And so it was very important for me to choose some reading and get back in this, this habit again. Sorry to talk over you, Ben. What was that? I don't know. <clears throat> I just uh, was... Uh... Yeah, basically saying uh, it's uh, it's a helpful reading and yeah, nothing nothing important. <clears throat> cool. There. I find it very interesting that he uh, lists shame as a strength here, mm -hmm. um, because you know shame's usually a very with a very bad connotation, but mm -hmm. here he says, uh, yeah. So basically, shame is a tool to rein in your actions and <clears throat> keep yourself in line, so to speak. <clears throat> I think, yeah, with the understanding, it's not meant to be something to beat you down so much as to say, hey, I want to look good in front of the other virtuous noble people. So I'm going ones. to make the yeah. choices that make me into a person to be seen well. Um, I remember having a awakening of my own, I guess, when I was young, like when I was a child, that was very similar to this thought process. Um, so this section was very weirdly nostalgic for me. <laughs> um because I remember as I'm being raised in my R-rated childhood, I've mentioned before, it was not a good time for deaths. It was a bad time. Many, many a bad thing happened. But in that time, I thought to myself, I remember something along the lines of, I want to be a certain kind of person and I don't want to be this kind of person. But And I could see easily how what I was going through could make me into that person bad type like that less desirable type of person right and so consciously saying i'm going to make the choices to become this other type of person and it really driving a lot of my life choices after that <laughs> um reminds me of this this section reminded me of that uh time in my life i guess yeah 
keeps you on the path. <clears throat> Persistence. I think we're good. It's interesting. Shame is the 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 kind of the unprecedented one in here, but then compunction and persistence were like, yeah, that makes sense. And really emphasizing the need for um, skillfulness, and then ironically talking about some nostalgia here. <laughs> um, he talks a little more in depth about the process of meditation where you can get distracted by the enjoyment of it. And sometimes he's, pro he's like, you've probably seen this happen. You're focusing on the breath and the breath is really comfortable. So you drop the breath and focus just on the pleasure and then you blur out to stay concentrated. You have to foster and maintain the pleasure, but you can't be focused on the pleasure to maintain the foundation of the pleasure. You have to stay focused on the breath. And this way you can get into deeper states of concentration. The mind has experiences of pleasure and equanimity, but it's not overcome by them. So I think that was a good little tiddly bink there. Anybody else got thoughts on this? <gasps> Hi, Milo. Oh, my cat has arrived. <laughs> All right, here's our uh, last little section for the day. Mindfulness of breathing, mind. Um, it's another, is the third tetrad in the Buddhist instructions on mindfulness of breathing. And so he says that there are two major points we should think about when we think of the mind training the mind. Ah, yes, this is where he was talking about how the mind is both the teacher and the student. And I thought that was such a fascinating uh, metaphor that happens in this section. I talked about it earlier, but now we're actually at the section that talks about it. Um, and so there are three senses of self during this whole process. You got the self who wants to enjoy the results of the practice and provides motivation. That me. Um, two, the self who is developing the skills needed to bring those results about. Also me. And the self who watches over the whole process. <gasps> That's me too. <laughs> this whole book is about death. Oh man, this book's about me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm stupid. <laughs> okay. No. You're Des. <laughs> I'm Des. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to be, have it broken down in that way and to um, come at these pieces a little bit by bit. Takes you through some steps about breathing and um, what you bring to the, the state of mind you're bringing to the meditation. And how you get fixated on stuff. At some point, he goes on a whole tangent about pizza. I don't know if we missed it because I was scrolling too fast or if it's in this section. Pizza and ice cream are both mentioned, yes. Yeah, he goes into it. They go into a tangent and they're like, but some people say I talk about pizza too much. So today we're talking about ice cream. <laughs> I was just like, I am cut from the same cloth as this teacher. Oh, my goodness. I would also be talking a lot about pizza. <laughs> Um, sometimes though to get the mind more concentrated you have to talk to it so that it loses its interest in thinking about other things this is where you can bring in an alternative topic of meditation that's more sobering such as recollection of death you don't know when death is going to happen but you do know that when it does happen you're going to have to be well prepared because your mind could easily latch on to some vagrant craving if you're not in control at that point it's like handing your car keys over to any crazy person who comes running past you on the street you have no idea where the crazy person is going to drive you so you want to have some control over your mind this kind of reflection can get you more solidly focused and can calm the mind down and this reminded me about singing at my thoughts <laughs> to get them to not become fixated. Tell me more. <laughs> I, this was before you popped into chat, Max. I was talking about how one of my struggles in life is a lot of fixative, fixated thought processes that I can that want me to get stuck in them and get in a loop. And so mm -hmm. one of the mechanisms I've developed over the years is I will frequently burst into a poppy or like catchy song in response to a like a 
a thought, an intrusive thought process that tries to come in. And so from the outside, this sometimes looks like me sitting in silence until I suddenly go, can't stop believing, hold on to that feeling. Do it. <laughs> but then I get into the song for a second and the intrusive thought doesn't latch on. Okay. I like that technique. <laughs> And so, and similarly, I was thinking about that in a meditation sense of like, you feel a thought coming that maybe is one that you can get stuck on and you start, maybe you're really mad at that person at work and you just, well, as soon as you start thinking about them, all you can think about is how mad you are at them at work, right? Like this is a similar, like, intru it, this is not as extreme as some of my intrusive thoughts, but you know what I mean? You can get caught up in this thought process. And so similarly, sometimes you have to sober yourself and sobering yourself can look like coming to these thoughts of uh, what will I be ready for? Or at my death as you know what if I just sing a fun song for a second and let that thought go <laughs> so there you I go like, I like that that's good Is there yeah a... I mean how many people think, sing on a deathbed that should be uh... oh man I will <laughs> yeah. more people should <laughs> oh man people are not gonna like me on my deathbed <laughs> I think you, they will Assuming I have breath in my lungs, you're just gonna hear me going. <laughs> if I'm there, I'll I'll help you and and do a disco remix. <laughs> we'll be in the same hospice together, just yes. beds next to each other, and just annoying the hell out of annoying everyone. the hell out of everyone. <laughs> Uh, we're going to escape this karmic wheel, no doubt, Max. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> All right. Um, when you've been there for a while, you can bring back the step of being sensitive to the mind. Is there any disturbance in your concentration? Here, we're not talking about disturbances coming from outside. We're talking about disturbance in the concentration itself. So lots of that going on here. In the force. <clears throat> this is disturbance in the force. And I feel then... like we can all relate to the disturbances and concentration in this mm -hmm. group. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very relatable. 10 out of 10. I like that, dis as I said earlier, despite the naming of this particular set of readings, it is... It's hitting a lot of broad ideas, I think, regarding the practice that are applicable in any scenario, right? Of releasing different um, holes that you have or your needs to um, unnecessary things that aren't skillful and helping you refocus to the skillful set of actions. So overall, I've enjoyed the reading so far. I look forward to finishing the reading eventually. Anybody else have any thoughts they would like to share regarding this train of thought? Um, one thing, uh, one thought that I hadn't encountered before this way was that intention is really important. Unfortunately, uh, I forgot mm -hmm. most of what I read about it, but uh, I think uh, the the essence of it was that uh, in order to achieve um, a calm state of mind and calming your body, you actually have to have uh, your uh, intention directed in that, which now that you now that I said, it, it feels kind of kind of obvious, but uh, there was a little more to it. I think even uh, I don't remember, but it was something like uh, how intention is even relevant for uh, for your desires or mm -hmm. to um, that that in order for uh, desires to arise uh, you have to have somehow intention in that direction uh, unfortunately i don't remember it, uh, all of right. it but <clears throat> i remember the section you're talking about and that the intention is that you are happy to let go of those angry thoughts right it's not just that i secretly take pleasure in my angry thoughts but that i I am changing my narrative in such a way that I am happy to release them and not grasp to them anymore, right? Oh yeah, um, that is that is not intuitive, but when you hear it out loud, makes perfect sense and is very necessary. I remember, yeah, I remember this actually talking about, but 
Okay, cool. Yeah, I might, I might go back and read that again. Yes, that was a very good lesson. I brought, I think, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a very good one to go back to, I think, and I, I, I might do. It's just, it's. It's a good one, guys, if you have time to read some of these sections. Uh, ben and I are in accordance, Max, that you probably don't have to read the Q&A sections. So you just got to hit the, the sections that are titled anything. So if you look here, the speaker takes some question and answer time. And it's not that they're bad. Like, they're okay. They're good. But um, if you're in a hurry and you have limited attention... I would spend your attention on the parts that have names and not the Q and A's. <laughs> yeah. Will you will you do me a favor and uh, DM me the link for this? I mean, yeah. it's right right there in the. It's right there, but Max needs it right there. Thanks. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I understand. <laughs> um. My my husband also have ADHD. Um. <laughs> It's not about ease of access. It's about seeing that there's a DM from Jess there that and knowing what that DM is and then being able to click it instead of having to go into the server and go to the thing for it. Because otherwise you won't remember to go to the, the channel. channel right? well, it's, a, it's a lot of extra steps. I get it. You're fine. Yeah. yeah. That's fair, all, fair enough. All good now. I've linked you to the table of contents because I find that the most useful link because you can Indeed. all of the sections are hyperlinked. So it's really easy to pick one because... I mean, the, the preface, the introduction, they're all right to read. But once again, if you're, like, looking to spend a, a finite amount of attention that you have, go to the – jump down to these titled sections um, mm -hmm. and skip the Q&A. So that's my recommendation. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Daz. Yep. These are the Dama Talks that we are currently reading. And if you want to look at the cover, here it is. They used that, this that whole, lava? I think it's a, it's a, like a calcified tree, but it could be lava. It's a tree. Some rocks. Yeah. It's lava. It could be lava. Maybe some, some strange rock formation or something. Yeah, yeah. Could be rocks. I, I'm leaning towards rocks now that the more I look at it. Three rocks. I like it. Very texture. I like the texture. I want to touch it. Yeah. Especially right, <laughs> this area. Looks interesting. I enjoy how distracted we've gotten from this, this one picture. 